So it's been more than 200 days since I first got my hands on the iPhone 12 in blue. That means more than half of the product life cycle before its successor hits the market. So how's the iPhone 12 holding up in all that time? Physically and software wise, how has the experience changed? And is it still worth getting one in May 2021? Let's find out in this video. For those that are new here, my name is Ashish and I believe that technology should be a means to an end. It should add value to your life in some form or the other and should not get in the way. So it's only befitting that the iPhone 12 family got this industrial redesign this year. And to me, this is its single best redeeming feature. The design is a classic and never gets old. Its angular sides provide a good grip irrespective of whether you use a case or not. And the lightweight of the iPhone 12 in particular Particular is an asset that you appreciate every day. If you use it without a case, it slips into almost any pocket and you feel this the most when you transition to another phone. Really, there is no need to go any smaller than this. Also, this year seems different because Apple is making a concerted effort to create an underlying theme in terms of the design and color across product lines. That means you can not only coordinate the color of your watch and phone, but you can get a blue iPad and now even an iMac. Basically, this is one of the best smartphone designs in the market and that holds true today too. And the next iteration is going to build on this with possibilities like a smaller notch and an in-display fingerprint scanner rather than reinvent the game. Now, if you're interested in specs, here they are on screen and feel free to pause this video to go through them. For an in-depth look at all aspects and for a full review, do watch my review video by clicking the link in the description. This video is more of a long-term user's experience with this device and its relevance in May 2021. I do make some quite specific and interesting observations throughout the video, so make sure you watch till the end. Use the chapters if you're short on time. Now the display of the iPhone 12 has been a mixed bag from the start. Whilst the shift to OLED screens across the range was a very welcome move indeed, the color science chosen for this year's models left a lot to be desired. I reported on this initially close to the launch of the iPhone 12 and a lot of users echoed my observations. In fact, do check out that video if you haven't already. Links in the description. But if you choose to turn off True Tone, for the most part, you're left with a nice bright display that is the bare minimum size for watching Netflix or YouTube videos and combined with the stereo speakers will not leave you wanting. It is still 60 Hz and if I compare it in slow motion side by side with the iPad Pro with its 120 Hz Pro Motion display, yes, certainly you can tell the difference. And given a choice, I always pick up the iPad Pro out of all the available devices for even tasks like web browsing. No doubt the smoothness of the 120 Hz refresh rate contributes to this choice besides the obvious ones of display size and form factor. But in isolation, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the 60Hz iPhone 12 display. In fact, without the 120Hz display refresh rate, there is little to distinguish between the displays of the Pro models and this, the standard model. Yes, they are brighter, but again, it's all relative. 600 nits is bright enough for most conditions, and the display of the iPhone 12 is good enough not to be a con, even compared to its more expensive brethren. One important point to note here, I also reviewed the new Samsung S21 Ultra which has a 120Hz refresh rate screen and with that phone the display was sublime. With the correct color science and an effective eye comfort shield or blue light filter that was marginally less yellow than the true tone on this phone. But when scrolling through websites, there was a weird tearing or juddering effect on the text that I found distracting. None of this on the Apple devices, iPhone 12 certainly, and definitely none on the 120Hz iPad Pro. The current battery health on my iPhone is at 95% and it is in line with what I would expect at 200 days of age. Over time, the battery life is marginally worse than it was when new. Now, not only does the wear and tear inside the battery contribute to this, but also over time, I've added more and more apps that use background data and location services, which no doubt leads to battery drain. 
But make no mistake, there's nothing that I do with this phone that an average daily user wouldn't. And most of the time is nowadays spent indoors with Wi-Fi connected. So the reliance on mobile data is at a bare minimum. So based on all this, the phone lasts more than a typical workday. But by the late evening hours at around 9 p.m., the power saving mode usually needs to kick in to make sure it lasts till bedtime. I've tested this continuously over several months without charging in the day. During these pandemic times, battery life scrapes through into the just about acceptable range. But I suspect when people will be more out and about using mobile data and possibly 5G, this handset will definitely need to be juiced up once during the day. Not a major issue for most, I'm sure, but this needs to be mentioned. Also, it's interesting to see that what might initially at the time of launch seem acceptable in terms of battery life will only get worse as time goes by. And so we should add this margin of safety when evaluating battery life for a new device. So the A14 has not been convincingly able to make up for the cut and battery size from the iPhone 11. Just as well then the Apple plans on increasing the thickness and hopefully the battery size of the iPhone 13 or 12s. I'll end the battery segment with a personal note. To me, the battery life takes importance over even the cameras, which is why I pay more emphasis to it in my reviews. And my time with the iPhone 12 has me convinced to go for the bigger Pro Max model later this year, unless the regular 12 improves a lot in this regard. Now, a very quick note on the performance of the iPhone 12. Really, there isn't a lot to say here. If you want the best performance in a smartphone up until at least September or October 2021, this is it. A14 Bionic is by far the fastest chip in the world. It hasn't missed a beat in the six months I've had it and everything is buttery smooth. It opens in a snap. Performance wise, there is no complaints whatsoever. If you don't want to compromise on performance, get the iPhone 12 or one of the members of the iPhone 12 family, period. The iPhone 12 debuted with iOS 14 and there were plenty of improvements within. I've spoken of this in more detail in my full review of the iPhone 12, so do check that out with the links in the description. But we're now on iOS 14.5.1 and with the latest iteration, the most noticeable improvement has been the unlocking feature with an Apple Watch when wearing a mask. It's not as good as having an in-display fingerprint scanner, but for Apple Watch users, it does simplify this repetitive task in the pandemic times. It's certainly better than entering a passcode every time you unlock your phone, but bear in mind that it will not work for authenticating within apps or unlocking payment methods or passwords. This is just meant to unlock the device. And that is just as well for security reasons, I suppose. I think Apple cannot afford to waste more time on launching the next-gen iPhones with an in-display fingerprint scanner or even something like the physical one in the power button, just like on the iPad Air. No other feature is as relevant in the current climate. Over the past months, I've enjoyed many aspects of iOS. The caller dialog box instead of full screen call notifications, the seamless integration with other Apple devices for not just continuity tasks, but things like picking up and entering OTPs, etc. is unmatchable with any other operating system and especially when combined with other Apple devices. One feature I make a surprisingly large amount of usage of is the dictation feature. It's really come a long way since Apple voice recognition of old and does a very good job of understanding my accent and typing 80 to 90% of what I say how I want it. I find myself using it to type large text documents as well as replying to messages and WhatsApp chats. It's a shame that it's limited to 30 seconds because this means you have to take pauses when dictating large documents. App clips and libraries are something I haven't found much use for, and I find myself sticking to the usual app layout of iOS. Besides all this, with iOS 14.5, there is an increased focus on privacy, and every app now needs your permission to track you before it starts doing so. I think not enough praise can be showered for this feature on Apple, and it is certainly a step in the right direction. If you're concerned about privacy, really, an iPhone is the default choice. Occasionally, you will come across some bugs, especially when related to this privacy feature. I found that if you turn off tracking for all apps, things like Truecaller will not function properly. So it's best to stick to individually giving or revoking permissions to apps. Even then, Truecaller's spam protection feature gets turned off with every app update and the option for spam detection disappears from the phone menu. The only solution is to then delete this app and reinstall it. This 
then again shows the spam detection option once again in the phone settings menu. But overall, we're reaching a point where selecting an OS for your phone is taking a less important role than it used to, with a lot of features crossing over across both the dominant platforms. And in any case, if you use other Apple devices, it's really becoming hard to recommend an Android phone. All part of Apple's plan, mind you. I'm deliberately discussing the cameras last, as there are few surprises in this department. No telephoto lens, an excellent main 12 megapixel lens, and an extra wide lens. Photos come out quite well and balanced, if a little less vibrant than something like a Samsung S21 Ultra. Video stabilization is excellent and video in general is super smooth. In fact, the difference when panning with 60 frames per second video from the standard 30 FPS is so great that it bears a thought and should be used for all landscape shots. In fact, I love it so much that I have switched to it full time even though the file size is more than double in this case. Nighttime shots are also reliable and will not be a cause for complaint. This is a phone for people who are seeking an all-rounder instead of a camera stalwart. If you're after that, the bigger sensor and more lenses on the Pro Max are better suited and even the space zoom on the S21 Ultra can make a huge difference to the perspective in your shots. Year on year, we see iterative and evolutionary changes in this area and for this reason, this can almost be disregarded as a given, despite the coverage it receives in marketing materials. I feel that the other aspects of the phone complete the picture and distinguish them from each other to make choosing easier. Okay, time for recommendations. In the interest of simplicity, let's assume that you've decided on an iPhone, so we won't talk Android here. Well, the next choice is surprisingly simple. I will make recommendations based on where you're located, if you're in India. For 90% of smartphone buyers, the iPhone 12 should be the default choice. It was at the time of launch and it continues to be. The price difference between the Pro and this is 35,000 rupees or $480. There's simply not enough value in that or even the more expensive Pro Max this year to make that jump. But compare that to only a $120 difference in the US and suddenly it's the Pro that makes more sense. Not only is it greater value with the extra lens that it brings and the premium feel, having experienced the extra brightness of the screen, I can say that for that much of a premium, it's well worth having as it offsets some of that yellow screen issue. Again, links to my iPhone 12 display issues video in the description that shows a pro model alongside a regular one as well. The exceptions to this is either if money is no object, then obviously choose what takes your fancy. And secondly, if you need the distinguishing features of the Pro or the Pro Max or even the Mini. As an example for me, having used them side by side, the next time I will choose the Pro Max for its increased battery life, bigger screen and its telephoto lens. I will try and buy it from somewhere where the price difference is not so ridiculous, but this line of thought may resonate with yours and hopefully help you choose your new iPhone. Now, the all important question of timing. Is this the right time to buy an iPhone 12 or should you wait for the next generation of iPhone? Well, the answer to this is similar in most years. We're now past the halfway mark of the iPhone 12's life cycle before it's replaced. We know that the design will not change much this year. Rather, things like a faster processor, a smaller notch and a 120Hz display on the Pro models will certainly get added to the iPhone 13 or 12S, whatever it's called once launched. There are other wishlist features like an in-display fingerprint scanner that may or may not get added this year. There will also be iterative camera improvements. Looking at all this, it's safe to say that the iPhone 12 makes a lot of sense even now in May 2021. Most likely, it will not get the 120Hz refresh rate display in the next generation and considering the fact that it runs on the super fast A14 chip and has 5G and Wi-Fi 6, there's not a lot that will change in the upcoming generation. So I'd say look for a good deal on the iPhone 12 and buy now. When it comes to the Pro models, it's probably best to wait as the value proposition will change with the 120Hz display and the other improvements, sufficiently so that the extra cost might be warranted in certain regions. That's all for now. Do check out the iPhone 12 playlist for other videos that may be of interest to you. And please consider making a purchase using my affiliate links in the description as it really helps support and grow this self-funded channel. Thanks for watching and I will see you in my next one.